Hello, welcome to this orange couch. This is a knitting podcast and my name is Kate. I'm coming to you from North Carolina. Today I have two finished objects, two works in progress, uh, one needle adjacent project, uh, an anniversary knit. My cat is playing with a toy. So, okay, so we'll, we'll keep going. Um, <laughs> and then I'm gonna answer a couple of questions about myself um, and my academic studies. So let's go ahead and get started. Everything that I talk about is linked in the description box below and my links to all my socials are also down there in case you want to follow me anywhere. So uh, let's get started. The first finished object that I have uh, is the Fold Lines by Nora Goffin. So this sweater I have been working on for two months, which is a long time for me. Um, it requires a lot of attention, right? Because of this amazing twisted stitch pearl texture all over, including the front and the back and the sleeves, right? So this is very characteristic of a Nora Goffin design. Um, she is a very accomplished, primarily publication designer, um, and a lot of her patterns feature really intricate and creative twisted stitches and uh, cables. And so I was very thrilled to knit this. It took um, a long time, but I finally did it. So I knit this out of Schockenmeyer Catania in the anthracite colorway. So this is a sport weight, 100% cotton yarn. So this is like a fairly heavy sweater um, in terms of weight, but I think I am happy with the yarn choice. Um, I knit, so I made a lot of modifications. The original garment is a very traditional pullover shape that's, you know, full length and hitting at the mid hip um, with sort of um, fitted to the body throughout and fitted to the sleeves as well. But I really liked the pattern on, like the texture pattern on the sweater, but I didn't love that shape and it didn't really work with the other types of things that I wear. So. I decided to change it. So I knit the 44 inch size. However, my gauge was quite a bit looser and this is really common with this pattern. Like if you go into Ravelry and look at the project pages, a lot of people comment that like no matter what they did, they couldn't get gauge. And so I just went with it. I knit the 44 inch size. I did have to rip it out and restart at one point because it was way too big, but I achieved a 50 inch circumference in the body. Um, instead of 44 inch and I'm happy with that because I wanted it to be boxy. I wanted it to be wide boxy cropped with fitted sleeves. So um, so that's what I did. I, I started with a provisional cast on. Um, in the pattern you start with the ribbing and you just knit upward but I wanted to crop it and I wasn't sure how much ribbing I would need to knit. So I had a provisional cast on here and then I knit one and a half repeats of the pattern upward um, instead of the two and a half that the pattern called for. Um, and then I seamed the body together, seamed the shoulders and the sides. Um, the pattern called for knitting the sleeves flat um, and then seaming the sides and the sleeves, but I found myself putting off knitting the sleeves because I was not interested in knitting them flat. So I just went ahead and knit the sleeves in the round. So, um, so yeah, then once I had finished the body and the sleeves, then I went back and I picked up that provisional cast on and I knit a split rib hem downward. Um, and I did make the back a little bit longer than the front. Um, and so this is a two by two rib, although on the edges, I wanted the edges of the split hem to lie flat. So on each edge, I did a four stitch um, seed stitch edging right there. Um, and that just helps it kind of lie flat instead of curling in. So yeah, that's what I did. Um, I'm just making sure that there were no other modifications that I didn't mention, no. So. Um, oh, and then the other thing I did, so I wanted the body to be oversized, but I wanted the sleeves to still be very fitted, like in the pattern. So um, I knit the body size, like the stitch count for the 44 inch size, um, which is oversized. But um, then when it comes came to, you knit the body upward and then 
cast on some stitches here and then knit up this armhole opening right here. And I only knit it long enough for the size down from the one I was knitting. Um, and then I also went down another needle size on my sleeves so that there wouldn't be too much fabric because my stitch gauge was quite large. So that's how I accomplished that. So um, it turned out exactly the way I wanted and the way that I had envisioned it in my head. Um, it, I really like how boxy the body is. It's really, really comfortable and easy to wear. Um, but I love how the shoulder is still very fitted. It fits super well. And I have pictures there so you can see that a little bit better. Um, but I just, I really, really love how it turned out. I think it's just absolutely beautiful. And I think it's going to be a great fall and early winter sweater for me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to... I'm going to do this up close so you can maybe see the stitch pattern better. Um, yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I am so, so, so happy with it. I think it looks really great. Um, so well worth the effort. Definitely one of the, I wouldn't say difficult because her patterns, at least this one, and I've heard this about her other patterns, they're well written. Um, and clear, um, obviously clear enough that I knew what to do to modify them, right? Like, um, I think that's a good indicator for how clear a pattern is, is if it's relatively straightforward to modify it. Um, if a pattern's really unclear, then I have absolutely no idea what I need to do to modify it. So, um, that should be a testament to the clarity of the pattern. Um, so, um, it wasn't difficult necessarily, but... Um, it was tedious because, you know, obviously you can't do this um, without paying a lot of attention to it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm super pleased with how it turned out. Um, I think I'm going to wear this quite a lot. I really like my color choice. It's beautiful. So that's done. I love it. I'm so happy with it. Kali may be coming over to say hi. Kali is my cat. She is coming over. You want to say hi? There she is. Hello, friend. Oh, there she is. She says no. No, that's too much. Okay, so my second work in, or not work in progress, finished object, um, I think was also a work in progress last time. Yeah, I had not um, split for sleeves yet, so I finished it. But this is the Spring Bloom Tea by Christina Larsos, um, who is a Norwegian designer of garments and accessories. Um, so here we go. It's a raglan t-shirt, like a pretty basic raglan t-shirt construction. I'm sorry, it was folded, so it's a little wrinkled. Um, pretty basic raglan t-shirt construction, but it has these beautiful lace sleeves which are just absolutely lovely. And um, they make the sleeves kind of look a little bit poofy. Um, yeah, I really, really like how it turned out. Um, so I knit this out of Barocco Modern Cotton in Barocco Modern Cotton DK in the Piper colorway. Um, this is 60% Pima Cotton and 40% Modal Rayon. It is incredibly soft and smooth really breathable and lovely to wear. Um, I think this is one of my favorite feeling garments that I've ever made. Like it's, ooh, it's so soft. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really, really nice. Um, I knit the XXL, which has a 115 centimeter bust circumference, um, which is about three centimeters of positive ease for me. Although I did add waist shaping at the front and the back, so, yeah. So, oh, maybe you can see those there. But I just added, I think I did three sets of decreases, um, sort of under the apex of the bust, um, starting there. And then I did one set of increases closer to the hem um, just to make sure that the hem wasn't too tight. 
So um, I did that on the front and the back. So that was the only modification I made. Um, I knit it to the length that was suggested, I think maybe a little shorter, but it does have a nice folded hem instead of a ribbed hem, um, which is a nice detail. Um, so yeah, all you do with that is you knit a little bit and then do a row of pearls and then knit a little bit more and then fold it in so it has the pearls are on this edge here. Um, and then sew it down. So yeah, this turned out really, really nice. Um, you know, it's the end of summer, so I may not get as much wear out of this particular garment um, the rest of this year, but that's okay. Um, I think it's really, really pretty. I really love how the sleeves turned out. So there's the lace up close. It's not a really difficult lace. I mean, it's, it's not really memorizable um, in the sense that it's not easy to tell exactly what the next row should be, but once you start the row, then, you know, you get in a groove. And... So it's not too difficult, but it looks really, really intricate and nice and beautiful. So I am super, super happy with it. Yeah, she. this designer has another raglan t-shirt that I think I'll knit next summer that's, um, you know, similar shape but the detail on the sleeves is that it has um, a cable running down the top edge of each sleeve and I think that would be nice too. I really like garments like this where you know it's otherwise a very simple construction um, and it's mostly stockinette. I like to knit lots of stockinette um, because I can do other things while I'm working on it but it has some sort of detail that makes it special. So. Yeah, I think it turned out really pretty. It's really a nice fabric. I think that's one of my favorite parts about it is the fabric is just so soft and smooth and like drapey, but not, not, not so drapey that it loses its shape. So it's really, really nice. I'm super happy with it. So that's that. Um, I think I will knit another one of her patterns. And Nora Goffins. I have, I have a lot of Nora Goffins, um, the designer of this one. I have a lot of her patterns and my favorites on Ravelry. And some of them are just so ambitious. <laughs> um, you know, this was a very ambitious garment and it took a long time. And I just feel like I don't have the capacity to do that frequently. Um, I, I do like to knit simple garments. So I have a lot of her garments and my favorites. Well, most of them are sort of ambitious knits. However, Christina Larsus's patterns are all sort of like this, where they're, you know, there's some special sleeve detail or something that makes it, um, makes it unique, but it's otherwise a pretty straightforward, simple construction. So there we go. There are my two finished objects. Love them both. Okay, so works in progress. Um, so the first one is, I think it was just needle adjacent last time. I showed you the colors I was going to use. Um, so I finished the colorwork yoke on it. So it's at a good place to show you. Um, so this is my first Jennifer Steingast pattern. Sorry. My first Jennifer Steingast pattern. If you're unfamiliar with Jen Jennifer Steingast, um, she's sort of famous for her colorwork yokes. Um, they are very, very beautiful. And that's just the thing that she does is colorwork yoke sweaters. Um, so this is my first one, and I really like how it's turning out so far. This is the Forsythian sweater. Um, and so as you can see, it's got um, three colors. Um, I am knitting it out of Knit Picks Brava Sport. Um, the main color here is cream, and then the brown is Sierra, and the green is Fern Hunter. Hunter. Um, so yeah, it's really, really pretty. I haven't knit a colorwork sweater in quite a long time, actually. Um, so I was struggling a little bit with my tension on my, on the green color. And so I, 
And I figured out a trick for it. I was watching Arne and Carlos, and uh, so they're doing this like really interesting series right now where they're touring Setestal, um, which has a lot of really interesting crafting and knitting and embroidery traditions um, in Norway. And they were talking to um, um, this, uh, what is her nickname? I can't remember her name, but she's like the sweater hunter, or the sweater detect, the sweater detective. Um, and so she is like a, a sweater historian, essentially, in Norway. Um, and she has tons and tons and tons of colorwork sweaters that she's collected and that she has knit herself. And so anyway, when they were interviewing her, she showed them a trick that she has for knitting the colorwork sweaters, which is that um, she doesn't catch the floats as she goes um, like I've seen before. And I always struggle with it. Like my floats, when I catch them, it never turns out right. But she leaves the float and then on the next row, she sort of catches it and picks it up. And so uh, that solved my tension issue. But then, so like from here down, I wasn't, you know, I can see clearly both the cream and the, um, the green. But up here, it was the green stitches were way too big. And so um, I needed some way to fix that. And so I did something a little bit redneck engineering, <laughs> but hey, if it works, it's not stupid. So what I did on the inside, what I did is I took a crochet hook and I, I hooked the floats together up here, right? So I just, I made like a little chain of all of the floats and then at the top, I threaded another piece of yarn through all the loops at the top. And I think for safety, I'm gonna thread another one through. Um, and so right now I just have it tied here at the back, but I'll weave it in. Um, and that fixed it. Like it tightened up the floats on all of the green stitches. Um, so they look better on the other side. And so that's kind of a ridiculous solution, <laughs> but I was like so unwilling to rip it out. And so I just started playing around with it and I tried just like sort of hooking all of the stitches, the floats together. It worked. I'm sure that that's like a sin to some people that are watching and they're like, why would you not just rip it out? I didn't want to. So that's what I did. But like once, once it's done and all the ends are woven in, like no one's gonna know. No one will be able to see it. It's fine. <laughs> so anyway, there it is. Um, I finished the color work yoke, and so now I'm just knitting on the body. Um, I am knitting this short sleeves because um, it's gonna be pretty warm, and if it's long sleeve, then there will only be like a month of time that I'm able to wear it in North Carolina. So I'm gonna knit it short sleeves just because that gives me a little bit more versatility in terms of how much I can wear it. So yeah, and I think I'm gonna do, um, I think some of the test knitters that did short sleeve versions, they um, did the cuffs of the sleeves in one of the contrast colors. I'll have to look and figure out which one I wanna do, but. So I think I'll do that. I think I'll do cuffs and maybe the hem, I don't know, in a contrast color. But yeah, otherwise the hard part is done. I, and it's so cute. It looks so good. I love it. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I'm really, really happy with it. I know that a lot of, a lot of people find this designer's um, patterns like a little bit samey. Um, like they all have similar elements and all of all of them are color work yoke sweaters, right? Um, but I feel like, I don't know, I feel like a Jennifer Stein gas pattern belongs in everyone's knit wardrobe. I feel like it's something you just kind of have to do at some point. Um, so I picked this one and it's her newest one, I think. So um, anyway, sizing, I, I'm knitting the size E, which is a 45.5% 45.5 inch bust circumference. I have a 44 inch bust, so it's a little bit of positive ease. And I've tried it on and it fits well, like it's not too 
um, it's not too tight and it doesn't, um, you know, like circular yokes, sometimes they can pull in too much under the arms. Um, and I don't have that problem with this. So it looks good. Um, I'm happy with my sizing. So yeah. So there's that. I'm sorry if I offended you with my float crochet. I know it was wrong. Okay. Um, my second work in progress, I don't have too much to show you, but I just started it last night. So I started the Stockholm Slipover by Petite Knit. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar with Petite Knit. She's super popular, but she's a Danish designer. Um, and all of her patterns are like pretty plain, but you know, intended to be well fitted, things that you can wear, get a lot of wear out of, um, fashionable, timeless, etc. So I started the Stockholm Slipover, which is a round neck, crew neck um, vest, essentially, pullover vest. Um, I feel like I don't have any of those, but I feel like they definitely have a place in my wardrobe. Like, I think it would look really good. I have a button down colored white shirt. Um, and I think that that would look, a vest would look really good with that and like a long black skirt. So I decided to cast it on. So this is all I have so far of it. But I really love how this fabric is turning out. So I'm, I'm knitting it out of Lion Brand Yarns Heartland in the Great Smoky Mountain colorway. So in the skein, you can see that it's like heathered but it looks a little, I don't know, it looks, when I saw the skein, I thought that maybe it would look too spotted, I guess. Like maybe you can see how I would think that. But once it's knit up, it just becomes this beautiful heathered gray. And like, this is gorgeous. And I feel like this looks like a lot of the, the wool um, garments that I've seen. Like, I think it looks so good. And this is a 100% worst weight acrylic. I think it looks so, so good. So I'm thrilled. So this is just, this is the top of the back panel. Like I've just started the increases for the armholes. So like at the back like this. And then I think after a little while I pick up and start sort of the the shaping to come over my shoulders. So that's all I have of it, but I'm just so pleased with how this fabric is turning out. And like, I started knitting it, and um, this is usually what I do, is I just start knitting, and um, if my gauge is super, super off, I will rip it out. Um, if it's a little bit off, then I may just make some modifications, like knock a couple of stitches off the body, or like shorten something a little bit, um, just to like make the gauge I'm at work but I measured it and I am perfectly at gauge on the first try, which is fabulous. So that's really good to know that I think generally my tension is close to the designers for petite knit. I've knit one other petite knit garment and that also turned out like the gauge was perfect. So yeah, really pleased with this. It looks so good. It looks so much more expensive than it is, I think. So I'm really, really happy with it. I think it'll be a really good staple garment. Um, so yeah, there's that. Okay, so needle adjacent. After I finish, oh, sorry, one more thing. I'm knitting the size extra large for this, which is a 45.75 inch bust circumference. The pattern has a, like a little bit of waist shaping after the bust. I think I'm going to add more waist shaping just because it's in a, you know, it's intended to do the amount of waist shaping for somebody who um, is proportional. However, I'm not, I'm very top heavy. My waist is 34 inches and my bust is 44. So I'm going to just add a little bit more waist shaping just to bring the waist in a little bit more. But other than that, no other modifications planned, I think, other than cropping it. I crop everything um, just because I like that silhouette. Okay. All right. Sorry. Done with 
works in progress. So, uh, needle adjacent, after I finish these two, the next thing that I'm gonna knit is the Forest Berry Jacket by Fable Knitwear. I have had my eye on, I think the first time I saw Fable Knitwear was in an interview on Fruity Knitting. And I just loved everything that I saw. <laughs> um, lots of vintage inspired silhouettes. Um, and so I want to knit one of her cardigans. So I will be knitting the, the Forest Berry Jacket. It's a cropped, fitted, vintage silhouette cardigan with like this lace and bobbles um, panel on either side of the button placket. Um, it's got little poofy shoulders, but an otherwise like fitted sleeve, which I like. So that's what I'm going to knit next. Um, I will be knitting it out of Knit Picks Comfy Fingering in the parchment colorway. Um, so this is 75% Pima Cotton, 25% acrylic. I really love Comfy Fingering. This is also made out of Comfy, um, but in the worsted weight. Um, I really, really like Comfy. I feel like it's incredibly soft and it sheds and pills quite a bit. Um, but I think that that calms down after some time. Like it goes through its shedding period, but then it gets better. So um, yeah, I'm gonna knit it out of that. Um, another sort of light tan-ish, like I realized that I had no like light neutral colors in my wardrobe at all. And so I was like, oh, I need to fix that and am in the process of fixing it. So um, another light colored neutral. So see it up close. So yeah, that'll be really nice. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you a shawl that I knit one year ago. I apologize if you can hear my cat drinking water. She's a thirsty lady. Okay, so one year ago I knit this shawl. It is Fallen Cloud by Lisa Haynes? Hans? Hannes? Not sure. Um, but this is essentially a blanket. I mean, so it's worsted weight. It's pretty big. It's super soft. Like the main part of it is garter, so it's all squishy. I mean, it's really, it's, it's a blanket. Um, so I, I knit this one year ago. I knit it out of Wasted Yarns, Worsted Weight in the Sage colorway. So Wasted Yarns is a Indy Dyer. She's on hold right now because she's like getting married. So she's chilling out for right now. But um, so she dyes, hand dyes acrylic yarn, which is super unusual to find hand dyed acrylic yarn. Um, and so I think this was the first thing that I bought from her. I have made several things out of Wasted Yarns yarn at this point. Um, but I think this was the first one. Um, and I... It, I made it sort of a, a fade, right? So at the top I have the lightest color and then I have sort of like a speckly and then a medium green going down to the darkest. So I made it a fade, which I think is, I think it looks really nice when it's on. I think the fade, like it looks really interesting. Yeah, so I haven't, um, I wore this a lot the f when I first knit it, because it was, you know, this time, like the beginning of October in Denver, I lived in a basement, and it was starting to get cold in my basement, so I wore this quite a bit right after I knit it, and through the winter, but, um, you know, now it's hot, so I haven't really been wearing much of it, but Hopefully I'll wear it again in the winter here. I'm not too much of a shawl person, but this really is more of an outerwear shawl. Um, this isn't a shawl I think that most people would like. It's so big <laughs> that I don't think most people would want to wear it like with an outfit, but it's a great outerwear shawl, I think, um, to keep you warm and toasty when it's cold out. So it's got this beautiful 
cable and lace on the edge. So a twist on either side here and then the braid in the middle. And then this is just like a couple of rows of lace. And then it's otherwise garter. It has, um, oh, here it is. It has an I-cord edge around this part. But yeah, I've washed this a whole bunch of times and it still looks really good. Not too fuzzy at all. It got softer, definitely, like with wear and washing. So yeah, it's really nice. I really like this. It's, um, you know, <laughs> like a lot of the things that I knit a year ago, um, these aren't colors that I would like pick again, because when I first started knitting large garments and stuff, like I didn't, garments and shawls and stuff, like I didn't know what I wanted to be wearing. I mean, I did, like my wardrobe was still very similar to how it is now, where I wore mostly neutrals and I had sort of a uniform. Like it wasn't that different than what it is now. But for some reason, when I first started knitting garments, I, I was knitting things that like were wildly different than the stuff I already wore. I feel like a lot of people go through that. And then over time, I was just like, well, I want like a tan shirt <laughs> and a gray vest, right? And so over time, I sort of calmed down on the bright colors that I don't usually actually wear that much of. And so, yeah. So I don't know if I would pick this color again, but um, I really like the shawl. I like, it's, it's so comfy and cozy. I feel like this will be really good for like, um, so my PhD cohort, like every week we go do some sort of outdoor socializing so that we don't lose our minds. But, you know, it's COVID, and so we can't, like, go into a bar or something. But when winter comes around, it'll be cold. And so something like this will be great for those, um, like, outdoor gatherings, right? Where it's sort of warm when we start, but by the time it's 8 o'clock p.m., it's getting pretty chilly. I think this will be really nice for, this, for stuff like that. So, yeah, it's what I knit a year ago. Happy birthday anniversary, whatever it's called. I haven't decided. I'm still calling it an anniversary, but at the same time, I kind of think it makes sense for it to be a birthday because the, the garment or item came to life on this day. I don't know. So, there we go. Fallen cloud. Okay. So, the last thing is just sort of chit-chat Q&A stuff. So a couple of people asked about my grad school program um, because I've mentioned that I'm in grad school a couple of times, but I haven't really gone into detail. I didn't know if that was going to be interesting to anybody. And so a couple of people now have asked though. So, um, so I thought I would just talk about it a little bit. So I am doing a PhD in epidemiology, um, which prior to COVID, a lot of people would not even know what that is. Um, but now that COVID has happened, a lot of people sort of know what epidemiology is. Like they know it's some sort of public health science about disease, but um, now they associate it with infectious disease and COVID. So I like to say I'm getting a PhD in epidemiology, but not infectious diseases like COVID. I don't know more than you. Um, <laughs> because I have never been interested in infectious disease, did not apply to this program with the idea of doing infectious disease, um, and I'm not. So um, I don't know more than you about COVID. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm getting a PhD in epidemiology. So um, in the broader sense, epidemiology is like an applied math field um, that's just surveilling and counting disease and looking for population level predictors and, and like protective factors of various types of disease and health outcomes. And so my substantive area, like my particular area of interest is injury and violence. Um, so like definitely not anything to do with infectious disease. So in undergrad, my research was about uh, police use of lethal force against people in mental health crisis, particularly people of color in mental health crisis. Um, and then so far in my PhD program, the, the grant that I was sort of brought on for 
is a suicide risk surveillance system in North Carolina, like building a surveillance system um, using data sets from a variety of health systems, from Medicaid, which is the public health insurance program. Um, I know that like less than half of my audience is American. So Medicaid is like the public health insurance um, that's usually restricted to low income people and people with disabilities. So, um, from, so the health insurance companies from Medicaid, from the correctional system as well, um, just to look at like population level predictors of suicide risk, um, like what sorts of interactions with healthcare systems and with the correctional system is predictive of later suicide. Um, so that's the like main project that I'm working on. However, I'm also on a side project that's um, assessing the effectiveness, or not necessarily the effectiveness, that's assessing the impact of a policy change at the county level um, to permit e-filing of domestic violence protection orders. Um, so usually if you want to get a protection order against someone that is abusing you, um, you would have to go to the actual courthouse to request that. Um, but some counties in North Carolina have, throughout the past decade or so, implemented e-filing where you can apply for it online. Um, and so you still have to go to court to get the permanent, like the longer term protection order, but the emergency one um, that can get the person out of your house like immediately um, and, and sort of um, start that whole process. Um, you can do it online. And so I am uh, doing a study to see how e-filing impacts the rejection rates of those. And then also like how often they're dropped because um, a lot of times someone will apply for a protection order and get the emergency protection order, but then they don't go to the court hearing for the longer term or permanent one. And so it just gets dropped. And so I'm also looking at how e-filing impacts the rate of that happening. So, um, so police brutality, suicide, and domestic violence, these are all areas that I'm interested in. Like broadly, my main area of interest is self and other inflicted violence victimization. And I'm particularly interested in people with mental health conditions. Um, so prior to going back to, um, well, when I was in community college, but before going to like my university, um, for my undergraduate degree, I worked in a mental health advocacy organization um, that was run by people with mental health conditions for people with mental health conditions. Um, I have a mental health condition that I spent a lot of years in and out of psychiatric hospitals for. Um, I was so frustrated with the mental health care system in the United States um, and like the inability of it to help me um, and that I actually ended up going to England for treatment. Um, and I spent a long time there getting better. Um, I was told that I would not get better and that uh, clearly was not true. Um, it was just that the American healthcare system wasn't equipped to treat me. Um, and so I started working in mental health advocacy because I really, I understood that I was in a really privileged place to be able to go to another country to get care that I needed. And that most people in my situation with really severe chronic mental health conditions weren't in that situation where they could go. Um, and so they just end up living in group homes and in and out of psychiatric hospitals and never really achieving the type of life that they want. Um, and so I went into advocacy because I thought that I could do the most good advocating for legislation that would improve the mental health care system. Um, but then over time, I realized that my talents and skills didn't really lie in that area. And what I, so I was working on some advocacy, um, like advisory boards for the state. And what I realized was that um, public health policy about people with mental health conditions, at least in Colorado, seemed to be very focused on making sure that psychiatric beds were accessible and that um, people were supported and taking medication, um, which of course are important. However, there were a lot of people, like myself included, who said, well, anytime I needed a psych bed, I could get one and I've been taking medication, but I'm still like really unwell. 
and I still feel really unsafe. A lot of people with mental health conditions struggle with housing security and homelessness. Um, a lot end up in abusive relationships, which I did as well. Um, a lot of people um, just aren't in a very secure place. They, they don't have access to the education and, and employment that they want um, because they're not well enough um, to like sort of pass <laughs> in the workplace as well enough to work. Um, and, and so there's a lot of employment discrimination and things like that. Um, people don't get the support that they need to complete college because mental health status is, isn't treated the same as other sorts of chronic health conditions in terms of, um, in terms of accommodations in higher education. And so, you know, the, the main thing is just that like, the public health policy was very focused on the types of interventions that a lot of people already had access to, but they were still really unwell. Um, and one thing that I was particularly concerned about and that a lot of people in my position were concerned about was police violence. Um, and so there was a study, it wasn't even a study, it was just an analysis by the Washington Post that came out in like 2015, I think, 2015 or 2016, that showed that um, I think it was a quarter to a third of people that were killed by police um, had mental health conditions, which is a terrifying statistic. Um, and so, you know, to me, that was really demonstrating how, how serious stigma and discrimination were um, in terms of like people being actually afraid of us and police officers who have the right to kill us being so afraid that they do. Um, and so I was really concerned about that and I wasn't really finding a way to change it in advocacy because the data was missing. Um, like people were saying like, you know, almost everyone, every woman I know with a mental health condition has been in an abusive relationship and our mental health status has been used against her, but we don't have data about that. And we don't have data about police brutality. We don't have data about homelessness. Like this is missing data. And the data that we do have is from like 2002. And you know, I was in school and I was realizing that I was good at math and that I had an interest in research and that I had the aptitude for it. And so I just decided that um, instead of legislative advocacy that I felt I would be able to do the most good in research. Um, and so I started pursuing a public health degree and then now I'm getting a PhD in epidemiology. Um, and, and hopefully I can do the research that my community of people living in recovery from mental health conditions really needs to be done in order to advocate for themselves. Um, so that was a speech. <laughs> uh, definitely turned into more of a speech than I intended. Uh, but that's just like about me and my background and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I learned how to crochet when I was in a psychiatric hospital in England because um, I needed something to do and help with my anxiety and, and my interest in crochet helped facilitate my interest in knitting. So it all ties together. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully that was enjoyable, um, like learning a little bit more about my background. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you joining me. Um, I really appreciate everyone commenting and, and, and stuff like that. It's really nice um, seeing people wanting to hang out with me. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think that's all that I have for you today. So I will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye!